Good evening and welcome to tonight's Meadville Tribune Forum for the candidates for Crawford County Commissioner. This is the second of two forums we're holding with the candidates for the race for County Commissioner. We welcome you here in the audience at uh, Benson Memorial Library in Titusville as those watching on Facebook via our friends at Lightning Strike Productions. I'm Keith Gushard. I'm one of the reporters with the Tribune. With me is Rick Green. He's the Tribune editor. One thing we'd like to do before we start is uh, ask everybody to turn off their cell phone just so we don't have a ring or something go off uh, during the middle of this so the candidates won't have a distraction. And we thank you very much for that. We do appreciate the candidates uh, for their willingness to appear this evening. We questioned about some of the issues facing Crawford County. With us this evening from left to right are Eric Henry, uh, Francis Wiederspan Jr., Daniel Hunter, and John Christopher Soff. Uh, and we are going to allow each candidate up to a two-minute introduction of themselves when we get started. And then we'll start questioning the candidates, doing a round robin. Each candidate will have a couple of minutes to answer the question. We drew lots to see who would go first. That's the order we ended up with. And we'll begin our questioning with that same person once uh, we do the opening. So. Without further ado, Mr. Henry, you're up first. You've got a couple of minutes to tell folks about yourself. Good evening. Thank you, Keith. Uh, my name is Eric Henry. Uh, I'm the owner of Meadville Ambulance Service. I've been the owner for 15 years. I live in West Mead Township on Franklin Pike with my wife and stepchildren. I also have a daughter, an adult daughter, who lives in Bloomfield Township. Uh, the entire time, this, this entire race has been the same. My, my goals have stayed the same. Apply business practices to government. You can't run it like a business, but you can certainly buy the, the, prep, the principals can come to it. Uh, control spending and be a strong voice for public safety. Those are all in my background and things I'm very strong at. I think I can bring that to, to the actual table. Uh, tonight you're in Benson Library, which I also thank them for hosting this in the stream and uh, PIN News. Uh, there, give you an example of good things that happened in Titusville. Uh, this building was open 302 days last year. There were 62,988 visits. Think about that for a second, how important it was. And a good friend of mine, Jess Hilburn, is one of the, the fine girls that works here. They had over 400 children in their reading program. So whenever you hear about Titusville, you gotta, you gotta look at it and find it, but there are good things happening in this community. And I, I appreciate everyone here tonight, and I hope uh, we can answer some more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we get to Mr. Reedersman, just one thing. You folks may see me hold up like a yellow card. That's when they'll have like 30 seconds to go at, uh, before they run out of their two minutes. Red is the uh, end of the time, and then if this thing goes off, that's kind of the timer of doom is what I call it. So anyway, uh, Mr. Reederspan, you're up next. Okay. Hello, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to listen and watch this forum. I'm Francis F. Reederspan, Jr., a Republican candidate for re-election as Crawford County Commissioner. I've lived in Crawford County since I was eight years old. I grew up on a dairy farm in Stew Bend Township and graduated from Townville High School in 1972. Cheryl and I have been married for 42 years, living on our farm in Fairfield Township. It has been an honor to serve everyone in Crawford County for nearly eight years. But I would like to correct some of the false information that has been said and shared on Facebook. Concerning the South Perry Street Bridge, it has been said that during the last eight years there has been no maintenance done to the bridge by the county. This is not true. I had the bills with me tonight. May 2011, $46,001.10 repairs the four beams and trust members. April 2014, $5,440.10 to repair bracing. March 2016, $9,410.20 to repair bracing and beams. In February 2017, $22,671 to remove the closed sidewalk because it was causing stress and damage to the main structure of the bridge. That's a total of $83,522.40 in repairs since May of 2011. This does not include the bridge inspections and the work done by our county workers during that time. In August of 2017, South Perry was closed following a bridge inspection due to further deterioration. The estimate to make the necessary repairs was over $200,000. Because of the cost, PennDOT would not approve the repairs to the bridge. And it's also been said that the county has spent millions of dollars on the Mead Avenue Bridge. It did cost over $10 million. Mr. Wilson, okay. stop here at that point. Hello everyone, I'm Dan Hunter. I'm a Sagertown native and I am a renter in Meadville now. 
I had a flower shop for about uh, 16 or 11 years, and I just sold that recently in April. And I've moved on. I'm an auto, spa, uh, auto parts specialist in Meadville now. Uh, over the years, I'd say uh, when I came out of my shell about three or four years ago, and I started to dip into the community where I found a lot of support for some things that I was going through and found out that we could all do a lot together. In those years, uh, <clears throat> we were able to come up with uh, several community-oriented uh, events that everybody was invited to, available to, uh, open arms to come to. That includes Thankful Thursdays, Second Saturday Night Live, Poetic Evenings, uh, Winterfest, Punk and Block Party, a uh, uh, number of other things. I've been out and around this whole county for about a year with MeadvilleCalendar.com, trying to showcase what everybody is up to in their communities where they live and find out that they can be passionate about that. I'm, uh, I'm basically always in the community. I have been for the past few years. I have heard stories from everybody from the street level up. Uh, about a year ago, I came to uh, Titusville, well on East Point, and we held, uh, we held our very first Poetic Evenings mobile show, and that allows a space where people can come. It's poetry night, but they also give uh, what they're passionate, so it could be writers and whatever. We had about 40-some folks there, and that was one of the first times that I actually really was able to, to be in Titusville, but years before that, uh, as my son was at the BMX track, uh, the Drakewell uh, BMX track. We did that for three, three years. So as we've grown, I've done other events and been a part of uh, what people want to hear and uh, what they, they want to tell me and what they have not received from their government. So what I would offer is that energy to, of course, listen and then apply a lot of that to some of the people's needs and work on things a little bit harder than what you've received in the past eight years. Thank you, and I'm Dan Hunter. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Soff? Thanks, Keith. Good evening, everyone. Uh, of course, thank you for being here, and thank you to those folks who will be watching or listening from home. And of course, thanks to the Meadville Tribune and the media partners for hosting. My name is Christopher Soff, and I currently serve you as one of your county commissioners. I'm a graduate of that university located in central Pennsylvania that shall remain nameless since this is pit country, uh, and I respect that. But I've been a lifelong resident of Crawford County, formerly owned and operated a newsroom in downtown Meadville and represented Crawford County residents in local school district and city government. I'm 55 years old, I've been married to my wife Lori for over 28 years, and our daughter Victoria is herself a young professional living and working in the county. I'm a member of the Titusville Chamber of Commerce, I appear regularly on the morning drill, and I also serve on the University of Pittsburgh at Titusville Advisory Board. You've most likely heard me say this before, Crawford County government is a complex and rather convoluted large corporation. The challenge is to maintain the balance between the 19 county elected officials, 650 employees, the seven unions, 88,000 residents, and the funds that are needed to continue to maintain the services you want and the ones that were required by county code and state and federal laws to maintain. Decisions are not made in haste because we understand that they impact your lives. That's why I approach every decision with the care and respect for those who are affected by it. And while some decisions are not popular, they still need to be made. You elected me four years ago to do what is right for the entire county. And for that, I've been both grateful and humbled. It's a responsibility that I continue to take very seriously. I appreciate the faith and confidence you've shown in me and would be honored to continue to serve you for another four years. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll begin our questioning with Mr. Henry. Uh, Rick will have our first couple questions, so uh, Rick. Again, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for uh, appearing here tonight. Uh, we appreciate your attendance here. First question is, what is the most important role of a county commissioner? Uh, good question, Rick. I, I really think the most important role about a county commissioner first is fiscally. And I think if, if you bring, bring some fiscal principles uh, to the job, uh, in the end you can do some things and, and help other people. But if we don't uh, stay fiscally responsible, uh, it, it, all of us are going to pay. A lot of taxes, a lot of fees have to go up. And uh, I think in, it's really important to look at every expenditure we have, every, every cost we take, make sure that we have to have it, make sure that we're not overspending. And, that, and the most important thing is the total cost of a project, not just what it looks like, but when it's all done. Do we have to add staff? Do we have to take care two elevators? Do we have to pay for more insurance? All those things are important. That's the true cost of what something is. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weirspan. Okay. Yeah, the most important, as Eric said, is certainly fiscal responsibility. That's the main role for county commissioners is the finances of county government. And uh, 
do uh, keep a watchful eye on the, the spending and right now we're in the budget season and uh, various departments, nonprofits, are have come to the commissioners and our CFO and presented what they feel they need for the budget for 2020 going forward. And we've been telling everybody there's not going to be a tax increase, so you're going to have to look for some places to trim the budget so that have come in a little higher than what they were for the previous year. And uh, there has been some departments that have been able to hold the line and come in even a little less than they were last year. But uh, uh, we've just now finished up with everybody coming in. Now we'll be putting that together and uh, see where we need to have to make some cuts if we need to so that it balances and there's no tax increase. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Uh, to guide, the, guide what we are spending to see what is needed, uh, uh, from my view, from where I've been the past few years, I believe the commissioner's the most important role is to talk and keep communications open. We have to uh, talk a little bit more and spend a little bit extra time talking to the departments that probably are spending too much. What are they spending on? But what we have to worry about are the people. And if we're forgetting about the people, we're, we have ended up with an unhealthy and an unhappy populace around here. There's many people dealing with drug addiction, abuse. Uh, we have to deal with those. And what that does is it costs us money over the years. So we have the beautiful programs in the departments already, uh, Carver County Mental Health, everybody that's doing their fair share. But a commissioner needs to be in between that and almost pushing it harder, a little bit more effort. Uh, that's the time that uh, has not been put in. And that's from my view over these few years, seeing that there's so much more effort that could be done for the people that are talking about and then receiving services, uh, we have to do that. And that will help uh, become a little more fiscally responsible as a, as a county government and find those ways. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sox. The, the commissioner's office is the funding mechanism for county offices. So, you know, maintaining that balance, as I mentioned before, between the financial balance between the other elected officials, staff, the citizens, and, and the understanding that the funds are, are only so many available in order to provide the services that we all want. Personally, my, my style as part of the commissioner team, if you will, is to empower those other elected officials and the department heads to effectively run their offices the way they feel are, are giving the best value to you because we are a service industry. Everything that the county does is to serve you in one way or another. Um, but we also have to understand, as we do, that we have to be sensitive to the fact that, no, we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have an open checkbook. So, um, of course, the financial pieces is the main aspect of what the commissioner's role is in county government. Thank you. This next question, we'll start with Mr. Wiederspan. Would you be a full-time county commissioner, or do you expect to continue working at your current position? And if you do plan to do two jobs, please explain the logistics for that decision. I have been a full-time commissioner for the eight years I've been here. Uh, I was a dairy farmer when I ran the first time. Uh, the week after election, uh, I sold the milk cows, did have my heifers, and I do have a few beef cows now. But uh, I've been full-time, and I will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Yeah, it would be a full-time, but with a whole bunch of overtime. And that would mean Titusville office hours once a week. It would, it would, it's imperative to be able to talk, to find that space. There's places that we already pay for that we can have that, that space available once a week. It's very easy to do that with internet, so we can uh, advertise that way. And eventually, not too long, you'll understand that we'll be at, we'll be at Titusville City Council, we'll be at Centerville's municipal meetings. If it's not just me, it will find other ways to expand that. So if, if our planning office, okay, you're off at 3 o'clock on Wednesday, you're going to go to Segertown's uh, meeting that night. So it's kind of balanced. We have other people on call in the county. That's the best way to kind of use those hours that we are spending in order to make the communication much better. So it's just stopping at a certain point. And a lot of people, my understanding in Titusville, that I've been here for long enough to understand they aren't heard. Well, uh, talking to Centerville, gentlemen, in just today about this whole idea. So that's the, that's the most important part. It's probably going to have to take up till 7 o'clock on a Thursday uh, each week in order to find out all, all of these issues that maybe have been swept by or not looked that well. PennDOT said, 
Let's understand why. Really, we have to get the people's ideas about what's, what the time the commissioner needs to do. So the commissioner is main, uh, mainly in charge of the departments, but we're supposed to be listening with the people and then bringing that to the departments, and then we can all work on it there. So we all know that most of these, these uh, decisions and all that is happening after meetings, and people are talking and not being heard. So that's the idea. So once a week, Titus, <coughs> Titus will easily, a huge rotation on all of our municipalities' uh, governmental meetings and then some talk afterwards. And I think that's, that a lot of things will correct itself after a few months and a year of that. So I think we can just sort of see how we can readjust how our, our uh, time frames are being worked out as a full time plus overtime. And yes, I, I definitely would give up my job, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Soss. Um, so on paper, the county code says it's a part-time position. That's about the only place where it's a part-time position. Uh, I, I will tell you, um, as a county commissioner, you live and breathe it. You, you're in the office or you're in the county facility or when you're at the grocery store, you're approached. Uh, when you're in the dentist office, you're approached. It, it is a full-time, 24-hour-a-day job. Um, but I love it and, and I, I welcome those opportunities. Um, and, and you'll be the ones to decide whether I continue to be a full-time commissioner or not, because that'll, that'll come on November the 5th. So, but yes, obviously I'll continue to be a full-time commissioner if I'm blessed enough to be reelected as I've been the past four years. Thank you. Mr. Henry. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I've actually kind of lived this life for the last several months. Uh, I didn't realize myself how much these guys did until I actually went to the meetings. There are, there are four meetings this week, uh, two tax appeals hearings, uh, one general membership, and a, a prison board meeting. If you attend all those meetings and you look at the regular schedule of commissioners, I can tell you it is absolutely a full-time job. Uh, two plugs, one for my family who's endured this, this uh, process because I, I haven't been at home as much. Uh, my wife hates politics. My eight-year-old stepdaughter, she loves politics, but she has no filter, so I keep her away from it. <laughs> and also to my employees. My 40 employees have handled the day-to-day -day operations of my company since I decided to run for commissioner. And they have done a wonderful job. And they will tell you, if you ask them, have you seen Eric on a call, the answer will be no, because I haven't been able to be around to see how this job works. And i got to tell you, uh, without those two entities in my life, I would never have been able to handle this process. But it's absolutely a full-time job, and I will definitely be a full-time commissioner if elected. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next question, we'll begin with Mr. Hunter. Uh, the University of Pittsburgh at Titusville is starting to transition from a traditional university uh, setting to an education and training hub. It's going to happen next August. How and why can the county support this transition? Definitely show up to all of those planning meetings that uh, they're holding. Uh, see what as far as like how can we take someone from the west and find they can find some education to the east. Uh, how we can plug that in, uh, we can we can work with them and working with like Meadville as far as their VOTEC or voca vocational school. Uh, should we interconnect all that and PMI? What exactly are they uh, uh, looking for? So I think on the county level, uh, then we could also, as far as like word of mouth, advertise what Pittsburgh uh, University is doing to become that training center, which we're finding out that uh, there's more. Uh, uh, people that into the labor industry, uh, skills, uh, uh, fabrication, you name it, that's where these things are going or the trend is. So I think what I had heard usually if you go to college, you know, I have not gone to college. Uh, I went straight from uh, high school to AmeriCorps NCCC or National Civilian Community <coughs> Corps. So it was basically, it was a bunch of uh, community service and that's how I spent a year after high school. And I, then I went to work. So college was just not for me at that point in time. So. Uh, I think if that opportunity was around, I may have had that chance, not just maybe night school at Votech, because I was just certainly working all the time at that point and with a young family. So those, those items, see how we could best fit the people that are living in our county and then, of course, express uh, reasons uh, for folks to come outside of the county into uh, Titusville, into that school and the training center as they shift into that. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Saw? Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a member of the uh, University of Pittsburgh at Titusville Advisory Council. And, and you know, it, it's a dynamic possibility of what could happen with the University of Pittsburgh presence in Titusville. It's obviously very important to the community. 
um, trying to make agreements with Butler Community College or Manchester Bidwell, um, maybe the Northwestern Pennsylvania Regional College, skills training. One tangible thing that the county has done is we've committed $3 million of RCAP funds to assist with the um, re-engagement, if you will, of the University of Pittsburgh at Titusville. And that's going to be matched with a million dollars, I believe, from the city of Titusville and six to eight million dollars from the university itself. So the county is very committed because we realize the success of the facilities of the University of Pittsburgh at Titusville and all the under, other entities raise the bar for the entire Titusville community and it and it's a raises to the betterment of the entire Crawford County community. So of course we support efforts uh, to keep that those facilities open and engaged and a benefit to uh, the eastern part of Crawford County. Thank you. Mr. Henry. Uh, that's a great question, Keith. Uh, just today, I spent the, most of the day at uh, Titusville. I'd like to tell you that I, it was all politicking, but I actually was enjoying peanut butter pie at Missy's Arcade, too, so that was good. And I met a girl that was there, and uh, she talked about the PTA program and the nursing program. That's the two things that, that the University of Pittsburgh is going to specify with when it comes to their classes. Well, we have nursing shortages all across the country, but, but in this county. A lot of the facilities, our own facility, the Crawford County Care Center, has a nursing shortage. We have to pay temp services come in, which is very expensive. A great way to collaborate would be to find nurses at UPT and have them come work the nursing home so we don't have to pay the overtime and the excessive fees we pay for travel nurses and, and out of outsourcing nurses. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wiederspan. Yeah, the county has been involved with the changes being proposed here at Pitt and Tyson, and we certainly recognize the importance of it to this community. As Christopher said, we committed the RCAP funds to help to <coughs> keep Pitt's presence here in Titusville and help to develop the, where they're going forward with the school. As it, uh, was mentioned, the Northwest Regional College, uh, uh, Butler Community College, and these other schools come together, present programs, not so much for uh, a student that would be living here during the school year, but maybe could commute and live in the community and have day classes and maybe at, uh, being part of our workforce as well. And uh, we've worked with our elected officials uh, trying to get their support and showing our support for this project. And we've met, had a couple meetings with officials from University of Pitt Tyuso, as well as with Jim Becker from the EPAC to see what we can do to keep this going and, and make it come to a successful project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next question, we begin with Mr. Soff. We're kind of staying on the same theme. The University of Pittsburgh transferred two campus rental properties to the city of Titusville earlier this year. Uh, Murdoch townhouses and the Joe M. Ball residence halls because they're not going to need them. Now, Titusville is accepting bids on these two properties until October 28th, which is Monday, I believe. I don't have the calendar right in front of me. But as a commissioner, and I realize you don't have any say with the city of Titusville, but as a commissioner, what would you like to see done with these buildings that are in Titusville? My first response is I'm not sure. Um, but I believe that those buildings, when they were um, purchased or, or uh, built, were the, the deed said that if the University of Pittsburgh leaves those facilities, they automatically revert back to the city of Titusville. Um, you know, I, I guess you look at the housing study and see if there are um, needs for affordable housing in Titusville and what that would look like. Uh, developers could come in and have opportunities there. Um, so I, I, as I sit here right now, I can't tell you definitively what I would do with those facilities, but I think you, uh, you, know, you get your economic development folks involved. Um, you see the Titusville Hospital get them involved and, and see if it can be something good for the community. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hannon. Uh, so I was able to attend a few uh, Titusville City Council meetings and they spoke on this. Uh, one of those two buildings, I looked at some pictures and it's in pretty poor shape. I'm not so sure you could do anything with that building, to be honest with you, other than tear it down. Uh, but I would say that uh, getting it zoned right so it has better opportunities to succeed, uh, but I, I want to steal uh, Mr. Soft's quote from the last uh, forum, uh, is government should stay out of the way and let private business uh, develop that and make money and hopefully turn it into something good for Titusville, for what Titusville needs. It doesn't have to just be housing, it could be something else, but it, it really should come to the, from the developer and not a government entity like ourselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Mr. Wiederspan. Yeah, I, I had an opportunity, I believe it was uh, early this spring or late winter, I toured one of those buildings with the city manager from Titusville to see if there was something that maybe some use on the county side of things. And, uh, as probably everybody knows and is aware, uh, Human Services is uh, putting in uh, some housing at the old QLC and developing that for a 15-bed home. And uh, I had talked to Gail Kelly about that before we got that project rolling, and she was, had some interest in maybe doing that down in Titusville, but since we're doing the one there, uh, we can't take on two projects, but uh, she was going to talk to maybe the human services from Venango County. Maybe that's something they could partner or be interested in those buildings. But uh, I'd like to see if they can be used. That is great, uh, whether it's for housing or uh, businesses or whatever. But uh, as Eric said, you know, it's not county government's job for economic development. That's the economic development agencies that are or in the county and here in Titusville with their own that uh, give them the opportunity to do what they can to make use of those buildings to the best of their ability and hopefully give them back on the tax rolls. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hunter. I wonder, uh, well, it would be nice to sit down uh, with the city and we'd ha like to hear what their ideas are. I know they're trying, they would try to sell that. If they did sell it or became maybe space that could be used, I wonder if we could shift some of our services, like uh, uh, mental health and human services, out here somehow to figure out through a weekly schedule that they could use the space. Because I know folks that are talking about their, the services, we have to drive out there now to offer the services to the consumers. So maybe if they don't, how, could, how I would look at how the county could use it. Uh, maybe, maybe we'd have to look at those types of things. Uh, otherwise, I'd love to just kind of watch and be a, a small participant in, in what the city is going to decide with those, those buildings. Uh, maybe that's a, a good place to think about uh, sending some of our services instead of just based out of Meadville. How could we figure that out? We might have to look where our employees are living and maybe uh, cut some of their travel time too. And the folks that can't get to Meadville, maybe this is an opportunity to look at one of those. Maybe you'd have to see how much it's going to cost and, and if, if the city does something with it, maybe we can work with them on how we could fill that space. But other, other than that, I'd love to be a part of that and watch what would happen with those uh, uh, pieces of property. All right, thank you. Uh, Rick, we'll take our next couple of questions. We'll begin with Mr. Henry. The median household income in Titusville is just under $35,000, with about 26% of its 5,200 residents living in poverty, according to the U.S. Census Bureau estimate. While for Crawford County, it's about 47,000 for the average, uh, or for the median income, with about 14.5% of the 85,000 residents in poverty. Is there any way county government can improve this situation, and if so, how? Uh, so a lot of my career, for 12 years I was a paramedic in Titusville, and so I, I, I got to see uh, how Titusville works, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. It was, uh, there was uh, a lot of people struggling over here during those years. I, I loved working in Titusville uh, as a paramedic. It was still one of my favorite jobs I ever had. But I will tell you that even, even that many years ago, it, the, the numbers were the same. Uh, I really think for, for the county government, the best goal for us would be to encourage the economic development people to look at Titusville. Uh, I, I actually spoke to a girl today, and she was talking about uh, the smaller businesses in town and trying to grow it outwards. Uh, they don't have the, the employment ability to have a larger industry come here. And so they, I think a good way to start would be to get small businesses to come into the sector inside of the town. It's a, that's a tough question, but it would it would take a lot of economic development and a lot of agencies to uh, to certainly get it head in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiederspan. Well, I think Eric's on the right track with the development of opportunities for employment. I know the Tyson Redevelopment Authority and the old Thompson Drugstore is trying to do an incubator there for some small shops to give people the opportunity if they think they have an idea for a business. Uh, it's very low rent once they get that up and going, and so they can try to have a business there and see if they can make it go. And there'll also be an education piece for that to help them with a, a development plan for business. And uh, I sit on the board of the Northwest Commission, uh, which is a regional de economic development agency. I know uh, I've had talks with the director down there, particularly about Tyson in the last few months. And 
the importance of economic development here. And, and I think this ties in with the Pitt Titusville. Given the opportunities for people to, to get the training that they can receive for the jobs that can, they can make a decent wage and support their families. And if we can do some of that right here in Titusville, that's going to be a benefit to, for those that live here and in the surrounding areas. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Uh, definitely the economic progress. These guys do a lot of work uh, in, in trying to get folks here. The city of Titusville tries to do as much as they can. The people, the business owners have talked with those guys. They're, they're great. The escape room is here in Titusville. It's certainly a lot of fun. It's very easy to pay for. It's not that bad. We can fit a lot of people in the room. It was a lot of fun to do that. So people that are entrepreneurial you know, these small sides, they're, they're carrying a lot about their city. Uh, I think one of the easier things that a county commissioner could do probably uh, with the census coming up uh, in so Meadville, if it's 24% uh, non-participation, so if that dropped uh, to 19% non-participation in the city of Meadville, they'd get a million dollars with the census as because there's more information gathered. So as a commissioner, we could be selling that idea to each municipality. So if you go out and really hit it hard, knock on the doors, whether people really don't want you on their property or not, but you have to try a little bit more. And what will happen, that number comes down and federal funds will come into your municipality. That's one of the easiest uh, things we could do is encourage that and then be a part of getting the census people or more people to go take the census, which is a really neat idea. There's brochures floating around to be a census taker. We need to knock on the doors and ask, get that information and really strongly encourage folks to do that. That would be one of the, the easiest uh, ways of, of spending some time uh, on the, uh, getting people to participate in the census. Uh, at this point. I know it's kind of out there, but it's there. It's uh, there every couple years. So uh, we have these funds, but we got to get more participation. And I think uplifting those folks and encouraging them will bring that bring us to that extra funding out of nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Soft. Uh, I guess I see immediately three things that, that the county could do. Um, and, and one is the first one is to promote the services that the county has that assist with the education um, and and career paths. Um, there are several out there that are already functioning. So our job would be really to, to continue to promote those and keep the word out. And if there are barriers to finding and keeping jobs, there are other agencies that can help. And, and having a vehicle for the information to be disseminated throughout uh, this region so people know where they can go to find the assistance that they need. And, and as has been mentioned, the economic development agencies do what we can to support them in either bringing new businesses here or enhancing the businesses that are already here. Um, the, I think the, the best thing we can do first is to grow what we have and, and then find avenues to possibly bring in new business. So I don't know that you want your county government creating um, the, the, the jobs and the opportunities as much as promoting the ones that are already here and functioning. Thank you. This next question, we'll start with Mr. Wiederspan. Crawford County's Adult Probation Department uses an office at the Titusville District Justice Office to meet with those on probation. Do you support extending more county services to the eastern side of the county on a satellite basis, such as one day a week or one day a month? And if so, what type of services should be extended. Well, I think it's a good thing that we can do that where we can. Uh, we have uh, Women's Services has a satellite here in Titusville now. Uh, some of the Human Services, uh, some of their services are, they have people that are here in Titusville. But I think we can certainly look at anything that, uh, where we could expand that some, that would be a good thing. Uh, as it's been mentioned, there's a lot of empty storefronts in Titusville that are unoccupied. And, Maybe we could use one of them for a satellite office and maybe not the same agency uses it every day, but they could rotate through through the week and uh, and do that. And e even at the uh, Thompson Drug Store, when I was talking to the, the ladies, the head of the Tyson Redevelopment, she even mentioned that as a possibility as a satellite for the county. And the rent there, of course, is very cheap. That maybe that would be something that all the agencies could go together and rotate through and have a t time to have a presence here in Titusville, make it a little easier for people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. 
With Titusville being the second largest city uh, in the county, we have to offer a little bit more. I, th I think it is growing. It's very nice that it's growing. Uh, the, the big idea is to uh, uh, streamline that. We have to get these folks in uh, a little bit quicker so that they can kind of just visit it on a normal basis. And we do have space out here that is paid for, and we'd have to look at scheduling and figure things out that way. Uh, if we, and that won't cost us any, anybody anything. Uh, we can get to uh, grow the mental health, which is uh, huge, uh, or what we pay for is services for folks and consumers. Uh, we could hold more and more uh, workshops, invite people in, small or large, 12 people is great. We had, we had a discussion about the bridge a couple weeks back. Uh, people will come because they're concerned. If you do that several times, then you'll get that pull of more information and what folks in this area would need. Same thing about the west side of the county, too. The more of these workshops you have, the more information shares you can do. So what we do, we have skilled and trained people. We could do more ACEs training out in this direction. We can really talk about trauma, which is not really being, uh, it's starting to come along, but we have multiple uh, programs and agencies that are pushing this. We're not pushing it, we're learning all about this. And where we're at in generations deep in opioid problems, we could talk about more of that and hear more uh, stories from folks that are living with that all around the county. If we can give that space, which we have the space, it's the time, and then being there and having that effort. So if we can be there more often, in those spaces, then we'll be able to create that environment that folks can talk about it, and then we'll easily uh, come up with more solutions uh, quicker. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Soft. Uh, uh, thanks, Rick. I, I think this question uh, was posed four years ago uh, when I ran. I'm sure that it was posed many years before that. Um, county code says that the county offices are located in Meadville because that's the county seat, and, and that was determined long before any of us were here maybe because Meadville at the time had a larger population uh, centrally located in the county, I can't know for sure. But I will say that if, if there's a group from Titusville um, or frankly any other part of Crawford County that, that has a concern, that wants to meet with the commissioners or, or any other elected official, it's very easy to do that. Um, we're always accessible. My experience has shown that, that if the mayor or the city manager have an issue that they need, they call us. I have friends who live and work here in Titusville, and they know that they can get me involved in something if it's needed. My concern is that, sure, we can, I promote the, the idea that uh, adult probation has offices here. That's great, because the court is right here. Um, but it would be difficult, I think, for us to only put other offices in Titusville and not do the same in Jamestown, or not do the same in Spartansburg, or, or in Linesville. Um, th their concerns are just as valid as any other part of the county. And then we have to be very careful to look at how we're going to pay for it. There will be a cost to it. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we know what those costs are. They're not just in renting the facility and equipping the facility. It's going to be in the staff that's going to now have to um, drive potentially further for their position. Um, you know, so I, I just want to make sure that, that we look at the entire picture. And I will say again, if, if any resident of the county has an issue that they want to talk to any elected official, we're always there available to you at any time. Um, so so I, I wish more people, frankly, would take advantage of that. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Henry. <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, and once I figured out the microfilmer today, I actually found the article where the same exact question was, was asked four years ago and four years before that. And the same questions that were, the same answers were given to that question, which was, yes, we would love to do that. And so I agree with what some of these folks said, but I can tell you that uh, there are three things that people may or may not know. Uh, we, we could use a district justice office for free space. We, we, we have an office here on the downtime we could help. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that our county treasurer actually comes here and makes a deposit on a regular basis. And she has actually picked up people's property taxes for them while she was here and took them back to Meadville. I thought that was a great thing. She, she gladly would do that for anyone as long as you got a hold of her. It was just one simple thing. She literally drives over here every couple weeks and makes a deposit still. And the third thing is the Catabus does have a route that comes from Titusville to Meadville. I had a gentleman who actually had uh, needed to register to vote. He liked what I had to say. He took the bus over. He registered to vote. He took the bus back. Cost him a dollar. And he was excited about that trip, and he, he, and he actually said there was nobody on the bus, but he kind of wished more people used it. But I, I do think there is a place 
for town hall meetings and discussions with just commissioners. Uh, people say all the time in, the, in those, in those pre-fed answers, let's have an actual commissioner meeting here. Those meetings are formalities. They're quick, they'll be done quickly. It would cost us hundreds of dollars to pay our people to come over here. But I don't think anybody on this, on this table, sitting at the table today, would be opposed to driving over here and having a meeting once in a while. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to move on to a topic uh, that's come up before, not directly, but the South Perry Street Bridge. Now, that's a county-owned bridge. It's very old, closed both vehicle and pedestrian traffic. City Council here in Titusville has uh, plans to commit its community development block grant money toward replacing it with a pedestrian bridge. Do you support that move, and why or why not? And we begin with Mr. Hunter. Uh, <clears throat> After a couple weeks ago, we were all talking, uh, about 12 of us talking about the bridge, and really what happened until we got bypassed for two years, nobody really went after it. Uh, it doesn't affect a whole lot of people. The count was about 600 some folks across that bridge. There's still folks, there's folks that live over there. The bus can't go over there as easy. A lot of concerns came up about that. Uh, really, uh, PennDOT, they made their decision, which was a sad decision, and it was a quick one. Uh, thinking, well, I think nowadays the times are different with the monies that, that uh, they repaid the Brown, uh, re replaced the uh, Brown Avenue Bridge uh, years ago. Uh, the bridge should be there, uh, no matter how many folks are going across. It was repaired because there wasn't really a lot of attention towards it. Uh, really, if it could be replaced in just a concrete uh, crossing, I think the whole entire city would be better off. And uh, in my opinion, what I've heard, uh, taking tally of what everybody feels about that bridge in Titusville, is that it needed, needs to stay or needs to be there. Whether you can save it or not, there wasn't enough effort placed into it, so you're like at the very end of it. A pedestrian bridge would be great, but I don't think that's exactly what m the majority of folks that live in Titusville want. So we, we really needed to do a lot more work on, not work physically on the, the historic structure, but how, how to save this, and it really was kind of looked to the other way. I totally support trying to find, at this final hour, some way of getting that thing to be open. How is that? I really don't know. Uh, Don Burden hasn't got back to me. Uh, I think uh, the officials need to be at the next meeting that we hold. Uh, that, would, that would be the perfect thing for everybody to keep talking about this. This maybe this was happened. There's a group that did try to do this in Titusville, and I've heard their story and what they said happened. So it really needs to be focused on hard, but we cannot pay for it because there is not enough money simply because of the judicial center that happened years ago. Only a few. Thank yeah, you. Got you off at that point. Mr. Saw? Yes, yeah, so directly answer the question, absolutely, I'd support. Um, transforming that bridge into a pedestrian bridge. But we all know the bridge is important to this community. Um, the, the problem is the Federal Highways doesn't feel the same way. Um, because if they did, that bridge already would have been replaced. What I learned in the many meetings that I've participated in related to the South Perry Street Bridge is that when the Franklin Street Bridge was constructed in 1940, it was constructed to replace the South Perry Street Bridge, not accompany it. But again, 80 years later, they thought, well, it was still in good enough shape to keep it, so, so it's been there. But unfortunately, again, on a rating scale of 100, Federal Highways and PennDOT have deemed that bridge to be a two. A two. Functionally obsolete, structurally deficient. Um, it, it's hard to fight that number. If it were a 60, if it were a 70, that'd be different. Um, county kept it open for as long as we could, but it was just prolonging, unfortunately, things that were set in motion a long time ago. Um, we do support efforts to, to have the bridge be given or sold to a private individual, to a historical society, to any other entity to own and operate it. Um, part of the problem also is PennDOT's standards on what they will accept. Um, there, there's been discussion that maybe it's the maybe bridge company something could, hey, we could put a bridge in there for a couple hundred thousand dollars. Well, PennDOT doesn't think those bridges um, are structurally sound. They consider them fracture critical. It's a term that I don't completely understand, but it's the standard by which they value and evaluate these types of structures. And you've got the muscles in the water. And, 
believe me, the, it, it's, it's a very long, involved process, and I admire everyone for trying and trying and trying. Um, uh, we're just not able to have convinced the right people, if you will. Okay. We'll have to cut you off. Sorry. Point. Mr. Henry? Uh, and again, go, go back four years and four years before, and the question about the, the South Perry Street Bridge is in the paper, in the Tysville Herald, uh, and very similar questions. But here's, here's the bottom line. It, the bridge itself is three and a half or four million dollars. Don Frazier is here tonight. He's done a lot of extensive study. He's an engineer. He, could, he found good. He found good alternatives. But it was the cost of the bridge, not the studies, not the engineering plans, not the the DEP studies, not the the muscles, as he says, or the the Oil Creek uh, Turtle Association, whatever else has to associate with that. Those things are all are costs. It's very expensive. So when the, when the state government said the bridge was redundant, and and Dan said that was a, a, too too quick, I got to tell you, I looked at the bridge review myself. It was very thorough. They do a very thorough job. And if you look at the bridge from your naked eye, it's in bad shape. It is obviously in bad shape. So although it was reported that no maintenance was done in the Herald, there was a ton of maintenance done. And, and honestly, this is the thing. I, I posted on Facebook so I, people knew up front what my stance was. I said I, I would not be in favor of having the general fund pay three and a half million dollars for a bridge. The reason why is I have to answer to 57,965 people who pay taxes from parcels in Crawford County. I, I don't want to offend the South Side people. I worked as a paramedic between those two bridges, at the station between those two bridges. I dealt with the restriction all the time. We had to go around. And yes, during construction season, it was terrible because they had to go to the Brown Street Bridge. I'm familiar with the, the Jones Street Departments. I have been there. I get the delay. But in the end, the county just can't afford it. And it would require a tax increase. And I think the other people might be a little bit upset about that. Thank you. Mr. Wiederspan? Well, I would certainly support the idea of Tysville putting a pedestrian bridge in there. That's been talked about for quite a while to, to do that. But as far as... Uh, a vehicle bridge, the cost is going to be at least a three to four million dollar cost, and uh, uh, the county can't do that because we'd have to, as it's been said, come out of the general fund. We can't use the Liquid Fuels Act 44 or the Act 89 monies. And I know per South Perry Street is very important to this community, but there's other communities that have like situations with bridges that are redundant, or they've even already had their bridges removed, and they have as far or maybe even further dis distances they now have to travel because there's no longer a bridge there. And it comes down to the funding and what you can use your money for. Uh, we've offered the, to help look for grants to put a, a pedestrian bridge in there. There might be the possibility of using Act 13 funding that the county gets each year for a pedestrian bridge tied with trails. So uh, to do something like that, we'd certainly, I would be in support of moving forward to try to get a pedestrian bridge in there, but I don't see any way with, with the point we are now, and it's been a long time coming that we can do a vehicle bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, we begin with uh, Mr. Soft. Crawford County Care Center is the county's nursing home out in Sagertown. It's got a budget of about $12.4, $12.5 million for 2019, and it's supposed to be self-sufficient. But as we heard before, they're struggling to have staff. They've struggled financially in past years. Should the county consider selling the nursing home and getting out of the nursing home business? Should we consider it as one of the couple different options? Sure, but we're not there yet, I'll tell you. At least I'm not there yet. Um, everything that we've done with the Crawford County Care Center has been for one important goal. Number one, maintaining the great care of the residents. That's still that was and still is our priority. Uh, we brought the management company in, Affinity Health Services, and, and their sole function was to keep that facility open and moving forward. It's not the desire of the county to sell that facility right now. Um, you know, their agreement's been in place since February, and, and we regularly evaluate the progress. We've made some gains. We've had some losses. Uh, census was increasing until, as you mentioned, we ran into an issue with LPNs, RNs, CNAs, a shortage that's felt by every hospital and medical facility in the Commonwealth. When we started as commissioners, that facility was a one star across the board um, based on Medicare and uh, Medicare and Medicaid services, five star rating. In the four years that I've been here, the staff out there has been able to raise 
those star ratings to twos, threes, and fours. We're not all the way where we want to be. We know we have some room to go. Um, we're approaching our anniversary with affinity, and we will evaluate and see where we are. Our, our census is 130 right now, not as high as we want it to be, but it's higher than when they took over. Um, I'll say it this way, we've not given up yet. I don't know what the years ahead will hold, uh, but we're still in the fight to keep that facility open and keep it as a county-owned facility. Thank you. Mr. Hannon. So my mother worked at the Croft County Care Center for about 20 years. And I spent, as a child, I spent a lot of times in a hallway and uh, meeting some different uh, patients. It was a great place. I'm going to tell you, first and foremost, it provides excellent care. The staff and the employees there are excellent. Where the problem is, is the census today is 131. They have 99 Medicaid beds. So this, the Medicaid payment reimbursement for that is $188.60 a day. That's what, that's what we get for Medicaid patients. Last year's expenses, it's two sixty eight seventy two per bed per day. So you can do that math. It, it is $90 short per day. And so that's where the shortfall comes. The bed census needs to be in 145. It's 157 total certified for beds. It needs to be at 145. People ask, how do you know all this stuff, Eric? This is my wheelhouse. This is how my ambulance service is paid, by payer mix, by insurance. This is how my employees get paid, and it's important to me to know the numbers. It is a, it is a very difficult task, and I will tell you this. From June of 2016 till February 2019, that place was mismanaged by a terrible manager who didn't make good choices when it came to purchases, staffing, and use of expenses. That is not those employees or their families' fault. That is our fault for mismanagement and oversight. We should have done a better job. And I'm not blaming these two guys down the road. I'm just talking about it in general. If we want to, if we want to do something good and we want, want to be good at a nursing home, we should do it good. If we're not going to do it good and we can't make money, then we have to sell it. That's the bottom line. But those people deserve, deserve the answers and honesty from people and not, and not a bunch of smoke and mirrors like they had for 18 months. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wiederspen. Well, first off, Crawford County Care Center, the people that work out there, they love those people and they do a tremendous job of providing their service and it's certainly appreciated. You can hear that every day from the families that, that have their loved ones there. But uh, it has been struggling over the last few years. We actually had a meeting with Affinity on Friday going over the proposed budget. Right now, for this year, they're at 200000 dollars showing the profit for the year they're in the black at the rate they're going if things continue they'll be at about three hundred thousand in the plus for for just 2019 uh, they need at least the 130 or higher to, to start to get where they can stay in the black continuously they've done what they can and are continuing looking at ways to uh, bring in more staffing because staffing definitely plays in to the profit of the home. I was fortunate enough this Friday, I was at a fundraiser and Mandy Eunice, who is now the administrator, I mean, the admissions director, uh, she was telling me she brought in three people that week that are on private pay, which is what you need more of to help with the bottom line on that nursing home. And she said, these were some of the residents that, uh, because of the care they had that they were turning away before. But she was going through with the private pay and getting the help they could to help supplement that. She's she put three people in there just this past week that otherwise would have been going somewhere else. And they're at private pay, like I said, that at the higher rate is what the home needs. And she's very excited about ideas that she's had that she can move forward to improve the census there. She told me when she started at Juniper, she did the same job. There was 40 some people at Juniper. When she left, there was 80. And she feels she can do similar for Crawford County. Thank you. We're gonna have to cut you off at that point. Uh, Mr. Hunter. I think it does need to stay there. It has been there. It's been there for a long time. Uh, and over the just a few short years, you see how fast it could go downhill, and that'll take a little bit of time to rebuild that. 
And with the management company that's in there now, uh, we have to follow and watch what they do, except to be uh, right there with them, which the, which you are. So as that builds back up, we'll get that care center back up to where it really was back in the day. And I worked at Quality Living Center back in 2001, and uh, the nursing home next door was always busy. The Quality Living Center was always full, and there's more often uh, uh, people out waving. We need people, and it's nice to see that they are caring about the care facility on, on, on uh, governmental uh, that side. So the choice to bring these guys in to help correct this huge problem that was created is great. And as we watch this progress, which it sounds like it is, and now everybody's reporting on it, it does sound like it, it is, is rebounding. So uh, we have quality people, and if uh, they're looking to make more uh, medical or types of jobs to get skilled to do these things, we can bring in more people to uh, work there. But uh, as it, it gets better and people understand that it is a caring home again, uh, that'll grow. So it has to stay there because we have to keep caring about our people. Uh, the ones that aren't necessarily filled with family or surrounded by family, they didn't work, they aren't on retirement, uh, they're, so, they're funded by Social Security. Uh, th those are the things that are happening. So as it's getting better, uh, it will be better and we'll be able to see and, and benefit from that. And the people that are living there will have uh, uh, more neighbors down the, down the hallway. So I, I think it's going to stay there and it should always stay there, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Well, we're closing in on uh, the 8 o'clock hour, so we're going to do our closes with each of the candidates. We're going to go in reverse order. Mr. Sock, we'll start with you. You have up to uh, two minutes. Thanks, Keith. Again, I want to thank the media outlets for sponsoring and for broadcasting tonight's forum, and uh, thank you especially to all you folks for caring enough to be here this evening, and, and um, thank you to the folks who will be listening and watching this at home. I've been honored to be one of your county commissioners for the past four years, and, and the promise that I will make to you now is the same one and frankly the only one that I've ever made, and that is that I will continue to look at every issue brought before this office and do what I think is in the best interest of the entire county whether you live or work in the western part, in the middle, or the eastern part. You put your faith and trust in me, and I have hoped that I've earned your respect. Abraham Lincoln is credited to have said, quote, I like to see a man proud of the place in which he lives. I like to see a man live so that his place will be proud of him. For me, that place is Crawford County, and I would be honored to continue to represent you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hunter, the floor is yours for two Thank minutes. You. Thanks for everybody being here. Thanks for all the, the pop-up media outlets that are here. It's beautiful that people care that much about their community uh, to be, and I'm part of that kind of thing, too. Uh, I want, to, I want to thank everybody that supported me. It's been kind of an untraditional campaign. I've done things a little bit differently. Uh, I've definitely uh, learned from a lot of my mistakes, and, uh, and a lot of the people that have lived here have been able to talk about those things with me. People reach out to me every day asking for support, advice, and connections that I somehow have found the ability to, to have, uh, just being who I am. And it's been wonderful to learn and, and to be supported by the community where all the stuff happens and where everything is affected by our government. Uh, this, <clears throat> we all have a voice and some people are learning how to use it. I'm, I'm feeling that I'm able to speak for that uh, portion of folks that seem now, you know, government's kind of scary and it's not. And out here in Titusville and your city council, it's been wonderful to see how much involvement you have with everybody from uh, the street up. We need more people in government who don't hide from their mistakes, who roll up their sleeves every day to do the work. And we need wonderful change makers who know what it's like to be at the bottom and know exactly what time is respect deserved because it's who I am and who I promise to be as the county commissioner. I appreciate your vote on November 5th. I'm Dan Hunter. Thank you very much. Mr. Wiederspan, the floor is yours for two minutes. Okay, I wish to thank Keith Gusher and Rick Green of the Meadville Tribune for hosting tonight's forum. And thank you to the Stream TV and Pin News for the, their coverage as well. And thank you to everyone that has been able to take the time from your busy schedules to listen to the four of us and hear our views and ideas to the questions. So elected eight years ago, I was committed to make a change in how I saw the commissioners interacting as a board. Through my leadership as chairman and experience, I have helped to direct a positive change to the Board of Commissioners. We have worked hard together as a team discussing the issues in business of our county before any decisions are made. Oh, excuse me. 
we always draw on each other's thoughts and background to do what we think is best for our county. No single commissioner dictates the actions of the board. There are decisions that need to be made every day that affect each and every life that cause Crawford County home. I've always considered how this, how every decision affects those lives, conferring with my fellow commissioners. In closing, I thank you for electing me to serve as a county commissioner for the past eight years. My office door has always been open. My email and phones are available to any of you to ask questions or share your thoughts or concerns. When you go to the polls on November 5th, I humbly ask you for one of your two votes for Crawford County Commissioner. I am Francis F. Wiederspan, Jr., Republican candidate for commissioner. And when you cast your vote, you don't have to know how to spell or pronounce it. Just look for the longest name on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Henry. Thank you uh, for attending. We, we chuckle when you say that because my name is just above his a little bit, but it's right there. So you, you can find us both pretty easily. Uh, I got to tell you folks, this job is not for the lighthearted. This is a very difficult job. Uh, they have to make tough decisions every day that's going to affect people positively and negatively. It's so much easier just to say yes to everyone. But you know what's tough is to say no. This county is so much farther, more involved than one judge, one political party, one new building, one bridge, one county care center. It's more than that. This is your tax dollars. I can promise you one thing. I, I would love to sit here and tell you I will never raise your taxes. I would love to sit here and tell you I will get you a bridge. I would love to tell you that the county home would stay open. I can't guarantee or tell you any of those things. I will only guarantee you this. I will always remember what dollar I spend every day and where it came from. Thank you for coming tonight. All right, thank you very much. Right, folks, if you, would, if you would, we need to wrap up here. Please. We appreciate everybody's enthusiasm. Uh, we thank you all for attending tonight. We want to thank the Lightning Strike Productions of Titusville, Luke Rio and his staff for videoing tonight's forum and getting it out on Facebook. Uh, there will be a link on the Tribune's website so you can watch this. If maybe there's a pan shot of you in the crowd if you want to see how you look on TV. Also, uh, we want to thank Armstrong Cable because they'll be showing it on Armstrong's Cable Channel 23 and Channel 100. Tonight's forum will be shown on Monday, October 28th at approximately 8 p.m. It will air again on Thursday, Halloween at 5 o'clock if you want a good scare. And then on Saturday, November the 2nd at uh, 5.30 in the afternoon. As a reminder, though, the October 14th Commissioner Forum that we did in Vernon Township is going to also going to be shown on Halloween. That will be on at 4 o'clock and then uh, also on Saturday, November the 2nd at 4.30. The last thing I want to remind you is get out and vote the candidate of your choice on November 5th. Again, thanks to the candidates, Eric Henry, Francis Wiederspan Jr., Dan Hunter, and Chris Soft for appearing tonight. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of Rick Green and the Meadville Tribune, I'm Keith Gushard. Have a good evening.